Hi, I'm James. And I'm Anthony. This Saturday bonus episode is a recording of an interview we gave on another podcast. Regular Words and Numbers episodes come out each Wednesday. I'm Anthony Davies. This is my colleague, James Harrigan. I'm professor of economics at Duquesne University, and James is the managing director of the Freedom Center at the University of Arizona. We're here to talk about our book, Cooperation and Coercion, and um, we'll probably mention our podcast also, Words and Numbers. We come out each Wednesday and talk about a lot of the things we're going to be talking about today. Cooperation and Coercion, we wrote as this is not an academic piece. This is for general consumption, for people who are interested in getting a better understanding of things that are going on in the economy and in government. And we started this book by realizing that every time humans come together to do anything, they organize themselves either according to principles of cooperation or according to principles of coercion. And the difference is simply, when we organize by cooperation, you're free to do what you want. You come together into groups, you do things. If it works out, you keep doing it. If it doesn't, you can walk away. Think about things like, of course, markets, but also things like churches and civic organizations, um, even families to an extent, or cooperative ventures. The pe there's no coercion here. People are free to come and join or to walk away. Coercion, however, is different. When humans organize according to principles of coercion, we have somebody or somebodies who are in charge, and they say, here's what you're going to do. And by some force or threat of force, you're going to do it. So typically, think about government um, as a coercive force. And we tend not to think about government as coercion all the time, but, but ultimately it is. Think about something as simple as, as parking in a no parking zone. We say, well, that's not coercive. And we say, well, yeah, it is because you park in the no parking zone, you get a ticket. And you say, well, the ticket's not coercive. And we say, well, yes, it is because what happens if you don't pay it? Well, if I don't pay it, I get called before the judge. And that's not coercive. Well, but hang on, what if you decide not to go? Well, they send the police to drag you before the judge. Yeah, but what happens if you fight back and all of a sudden you see force? Behind every government edict, no matter how um, innocuous, is ultimately the threat of force. And we're not saying that's a good thing or a bad thing. We're just saying it's a thing. And what we found as we wrote this book is that there are times when coercion is the right form of organization. There are other times when cooperation is the right form of organization. And the trick to developing a healthy society is knowing which of those two forms of organization to apply to which problem? I always feel like Teller. Teller? Teller, the magician <laughs> sits next to you, Penn, and says almost nothing. Anyway, um, I've, I've got a, a funny story about the phenomenon you're just talking about. I, uh, I had a, a violation that I received a ticket for in the great state of Utah, and I had to go appear before the judge that was just woven right into it. And the judge, I, I was kind of caught off, off guard because I thought I was going to have to pay like a $20 ticket or something. And the judge said, Mr. Harrigan, that will be $300. Ooh. And then he said this, do you want to pay that today? And I said, no, I, <laughs> I, don't, I do not. I don't want to pay, that. Want to pay it tomorrow. I don't either. want to pay that any day. But, you know, that's a lighthearted look at a stupid thing. But really, if you if you dig a little deeper, every law brings with it implicitly the death sentence. That's the end of the, right. If you keep on pushing against it, that's where you end up. And, and we can remember people like Eric Garner, who, who was killed. What was his, his crime? Selling loose cigarettes on a street corner. Mm. Now, I know that's a crime, but th that is a, a radically disproportionate kind of sentence. And the more we thought about these things, and, and you should realize that these are not hard, fast categories, right? These are just two big, giant, soft buckets that we, we throw things into. Is anything perfectly cooperative? Well, probably not. Is anything completely coercive? Well, I mean, short of prison, no. Uh, but it just allows us a way to think about these sorts of things. Can we, for the most part, cooperate and get better results? Or is this one of those times that some kind of ham-fisted coercion is absolutely necessary? 
And there are times when it is. And this allowed us to take a bunch of issues and, and lay them down on the table and really take a look at how best to deal with them. So, you know, a good case in point is um, think about driving. Um, we think of driving as a cooperative venture. It would fall into the cooperation bucket. And what I mean by that is um, you're, you get in your car and you're free to you drive wherever you want. And, you know, you can turn left, you can turn right. That's up to you. Imagine if we did driving by coercion, how, what that would look like. So every car, the windows would all be painted black and there would be cameras perhaps on the front and the back and the sides. And all these camera feeds would go to a central location. And in the central location, smart people would look at all of this stuff and they would radio instructions to you. So you're there in the driver's seat with headphones on, and they would say, all right, driver number 12, turn left, driver number 17, speed up, slow down, whatever it is. And clearly, that's a stupid way to drive. The better way to drive is let each driver decide for him or herself what you're going to do. And so we think of driving as, as a cooperative sort of form of organization rather than coercive, except, as James says, it's not entirely one or the other. We do use coercion. But look at what form the coercion takes. It's rules like you have to drive on the right side of the road. When the light is red, you have to stop. When it's green, you can go. When there's a speed limit sign, you can't drive faster than that. So we use this mix of cooperation and coercion when we're driving. And if you think about how we decide which to use, what you find is a pattern. We tend to use the coercion when our aim is to prevent people from harming others. So the stop at the stoplight, the drive on the right side of the road, don't go faster than the speed limit. These are all rules intended to prevent you from harming other people. Apart from that, we let you do what you want. That's the cooperation side. And that's kind of where we fall with this book of coming to the conclusion that the best use of these two tools falls into those into that sort of, 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 of decision-making system. Ask the question, is your goal to stop people from harming each other? If the answer is yes, coercion is the right form of organization. Otherwise, cooperation is. Yeah, and it, it, it's actually how much of this belongs to one side and belongs to the other it is actually kind of surprising when you start unpacking things. And I'm happy to tell you that my bias when we started looking at these sorts of things was to get government out of almost everything. I mean, it seems like an abject failure every time it gets its roots deep into a, a problem. And yet the, the point of view I had coming out of it was probably a little different, um, where I said, look, government should get out of these things to this extent, but we probably are going to need you know, some kind of rule to keep things sensible, to, to create a system in which we all know what the expectations are and how we can live together without writing something that's so long in terms of a law code that it, it would never be read. And I, I think that's what we fundamentally have. We have laws now, there are so many of them, that nobody, not one person could tell you what they all are. And that's a problem. But if you look at the system that we live in, and I hesitate to call it a system, I, I just, I don't know what else to call it, right? If you look at the, at the world that we live in, it seems that most of us understand almost all of the rules implicitly well enough to get by just fine. And, and that's, a, that's an interesting thing. So how much of this do we have to know? And I'm going to say most of it, right? John Locke will tell you that a law is not a law unless it's been promulgated. You have to have the opportunity to have heard it and to understand it. I know that we don't meet that bar literally ever at this point in the United States, which means we don't meet it anywhere else all that well either. And, and yet here, here we are, and I'm willing to say we need a fair amount of government to do this one thing, to keep people from hurting each other. And this, this is the reason why this is more of a statement than you might think is that it also includes things like pollution, right? If, if Ant here um, is running his oil from his car down his driveway and into the, the gutter, into the, the grate at the end of the, the driveway, that's going to make its way into the drinking water supply and many people will be harmed. So harm is a little bigger than you might think it is. So I would want to cover things like that. And at the same time, I think in an ideal world, 
we would make sure that Eric Garner's name never became something that we all knew, right? That was a man I should never have become aware of. And I wouldn't have unless he was executed on a street corner for selling a loose cigarette. So you can see that we probably have our work cut out for us when you think about these things. Ant talks about driving, but we looked at a bunch of different issues in the course of the book. It's, it's a very typical book in a lot of ways. The first three chapters are, are more theoretical and set the stage. The, all the latter chapters are about single issues and how we might apply these two ideas to them to get a better understanding of them in the first place and how we might deal with them in the second. James started off by saying government is problematic and we want to do little of it. And I want to unpack that a little bit because that's not a, that, that's not a political statement, but rather it's a realistic statement. And it has its roots in what the Greeks um, introduced, uh, the knowledge problem. The knowledge problem simply is nobody has the knowledge to be able to make decisions for you that are better than you can make for yourself. Now, there are some exceptions to that if you're talking about a parent and a young child, but generally speaking, if you're talking about you know, fully functional adults, I don't know what's good for you better than you know for yourself. And so when you ask me to make decisions for you, the best, the best I'm gonna do is the same thing you'd be able to do on your own. And likely I'm going to do worse simply because I don't understand you or your problems or your circumstances or, or your constraints. And this is what happens when we ask government to do things for us. We're quite literally asking other human beings to make decisions for us when those other human beings suffer from this serious knowledge problem. And the other human beings are only too happy to do it because you know, and just think about the presidential turn of events that we've just witnessed in the past year or so. Um, I think Elizabeth Warren is probably the best example of this, but every other candidate, including um, President Trump on, on the other side, uh, running uncontested for the Republican nomination falls into the same category. Whenever asked uh, a question about what should be done about anything, Elizabeth Warren's reflexive answer begins, I have a plan for that. And you should really worry about people that have that many plans for that many things, because how many could actually be reasonable? How many could one person wrap a brain around in order to give a good, comprehensive, fair and just answer? And I, it's my firm belief that the answer is not many. Um, it's going to be very, very difficult for any one person to figure out things of that scope. And you might remember uh, two, uh, two cycles ago when Gary Johnson was running as a libertarian, somebody asked him about the city of Aleppo in Syria, and, and he committed the cardinal political sin and said, I don't know what that is. I thought that that was such a perfect answer. Why would I expect him to know what that is? Right? I expect him to know what it is if it heats up. I expect him to know who to ask to find out what we need to know about that, but I don't expect him to know every single thing or even anything about Aleppo, Syria. And if you think about it, I mean, does that extend to every other city in the, in the world? I mean, are we supposed to ask every candidate about every city? What a waste of everybody's time that would be. But they're only too happy to tell you when they've got a plan that will impact you very deeply. And the odd thing is, is they all have the same basic plans every four years and nothing ever actually changes. Why is it that every four years I get made the same promises and then they never get kept? And I think you have to realize that I get the promises because that's how they get votes and they never get kept because they can't get kept. They're impossible. We had said to, um, to Allison to, to feel free to interrupt us with questions as we're talking. And I meant to say that at the beginning, if any of you have questions, feel free. You can put them in the chat box or um, you can unmute yourself. Just feel free in, to interrupt. And you kind of have to, because James goes on and on. Just shut up. We, we, um, we, I should tell you, we can't see you. So we don't know if there's nobody here or a hundred people here. But he'll talk anyway. Shut up. <laughs> We've been doing this far too long, as you could probably tell. So we start off we, in, in cooperation coercion, talking about this knowledge problem that people simply aren't able to make decisions for others better than the others are 
for themselves, not because they're stupid, right? We're not making the argument here that politicians are stupid. We're not even making the argument that, that they're selfish. Rather, we're making the argument they simply don't have enough information. Now, be careful, because we are not saying that individuals, when they make decisions for themselves, are going to make them perfectly. We all make mistakes, right? You think back to, you know, your college days, when I'm sure you made plenty, and hopefully as adults, you're making fewer, but we're still making mistakes. Why? Because we're fallible human beings. But so too are politicians. They're the same brand of fallible human being. So to the extent that we're going to make mistakes in making decisions for ourselves, they're going to make mistakes in making decisions for us also. But they have this added problem that they have less information than we do. And so we come to this idea that cooperation, that is, leave people alone to make decisions for themselves, is the best, is the best organizational principle provided you're also using coercion to prevent people from harming each other. And, you know, we talked about, when you think about preventing people from harming each other, you think about violence. James says it also includes things like pollution. And I'll go further. It includes things like fraud. If a company defrauds a customer or doesn't fulfill a contract, that's also imposing harm on someone else. And it's an appropriate uh, place for government to step in with coercion and say, you must make this better. And, and Ant just did some argumentative sleight of hand here. What he ended up doing was to link what we know from the ancient Greeks. I'm, I'll talk about Socrates for just a moment. Um, one of the things that Socrates is famed for saying is really what we're saying here that he was wise because he knew that he knew nothing. And, and that, all right, that's ridiculous. He knew plenty. But what he's trying to get you to think is that relative to everything there is to know, he didn't know much. And, and he was one of the smartest people in the world in human history. He knew a lot and he knew as much at the time, but he was always trying to point to this problem, what we've come to call the knowledge problem to exercise some humility to say something like, look, I might be wrong, but it's all about how you look at the problem. It's best to take a, a cue from him and say, all right, let's maybe step back a second and think about what we might be missing here. And then Ant from there talks about the quality of people. So he's getting into public choice, which is a, a way of understanding economics and also pol 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 politics, geez. Um, and the central vision of public choice is that people in government are exactly the same as people out of government, that you don't get in, in the words of James Madison in 1787, angels governing you. What you get are regular flawed people just like the rest of us. And sometimes they're actually going to govern pretty well, and sometimes they'll govern not at all. But you have got to understand that these are not special people, right? They're, um, they're exactly we actually have a question. Right. Sure. We actually have a question from Matt. Um, he asks, protecting people from the consequences of their actions, is that compassionate or overreaching? Well, saving people from themselves, that's a difficult game to play. And I think there are times when every rational human being can look at something and say, yes, this is one of those times. Um, you know, you, I, you get the, I, I immediately am drawn to suicides, right? And that's probably always, if not always, almost always, the, cor the incorrect answer to a problem. I say almost always because I, I've been watching things from the Nuremberg trials lately, and some of those suicides we would let go. But if you see a 20-year-old man getting ready to jump off a bridge, I think grabbing him and bringing him back onto the, the bridge, perfectly reasonable. Um, I get very uncomfortable when we save people from themselves because it's almost always something that's not nearly that obvious, right? Um, we're going to save people from themselves if they smoke marijuana until the last few years. How many lives were ruined over a pointless thing that never caused anybody any harm? and yet had people land in prison and it, was, it certainly did have people land in prison and here i get i just get much more worried about it i always look for the obvious case and there always is an obvious case but then i look at all the other ones that the nanny state seems to be interested in and it makes me very nervous yeah and there 
I share James' concern here because, you know, on the one hand, there are things like suicide where, you know, clearly if you can step in and stop the person, that's, that, that's the obvious thing to do. But when you suggest that we should use coercion to, to prevent people from harming themselves, your premise here is that we are no longer equal. Well, I don't think it's his premise. No, no, no I'm telling you yours. But one who would make that argument. The premise is that we are no longer equal to human beings because some of us should have the right to impose our decisions on somebody else. That is, um, James is going to do something stupid and I have the right to stop him from doing this stupid thing. Now, you can say on the outcome side, well, but look, if you do stop him from doing this stupid thing, he'll be better off. Yeah, he'll be better off in that sense that he, I stopped him from doing something stupid. But he's worse off in a very important sense that I have established that we are no longer equal, that I am superior to him in a rights sense. Yeah. I have destroyed his human dignity. There, well, that's probably impossible. <laughs> anyway, um, there's an interesting case here, and Ant and I wrote about it some time ago, and we still think about it quite a bit. It's when the um, that do-gooder brigade out in Philadelphia decided that they were going to deny the right of people to have uh, sugary sodas and drinks and such. They weren't going to deny it wholesale. They're just going to add lots of taxes to it to, to discourage people from, from drinking what they wanted to drink. And, and look at all of the, look at everything that's implied by that action. We're implying that, okay, um, this thing is bad. We're also implying that you are guilty in some sense for wanting it. And then we're implying that it's perfectly acceptable for us to make it harder for you to get this. And, and that layer of nannyism that sits right on top of all this, we ended up referring to these people as busy bullies, right? That, that they have all the worst characteristics, busybodies on the one hand, bullies on the other. And everywhere you look, you see some evidence of this sort of thinking. Um, generally speaking, it's not that far up to the surface as it is in Philadelphia, with the sugary drinks tax, but there's something of it almost everywhere you can go. And it becomes a little tiresome after a while. And, and consider, you know, it, from our armchairs, we can imagine sterile cases where the person's making a decision, clearly it's a bad decision. And this person who's going to impose a better decision actually has the better solution. In a sterile environment, you can kind of see that maybe this would work, but we don't live in a sterile environment. And if we open up the doors to some human beings being able to impose their will on other human beings, you run into the problem that the human beings imposing their will have the same flaws as those on whom the will is imposed. And so you can end up in a situation where the people are imposing um, uh, rules or behaviors that actually are detrimental. And it's funny because the, the book itself, the entire project, I think, probably got started when one of us said, why do people keep saying there ought to be a law? Because there ought to be a law. That's the prelude to some kind of world class foolishness that's about to happen. And it, it's almost universal. Actually. Yeah. And, and how does all the go ahead. Oh, going back to the distinction, um, or going back to your example of suicide and why um, we might not criminalize people from stopping others from committing it, even though that could be an act of coercion. You know, you grab someone, you stop them from jumping off. Could you quickly uh, discuss sort of the distinction between government criminalizing suicide and government not criminalizing private citizens from using their coercion or, or their course of acts to stop someone? committing suicide yeah i think I, i'm if i'm understanding the question here uh the argument we were making is in general person a should not impose his will on person b and we threw out suicide as a possible counter example the person b is about to commit suicide and this is probably an appropriate place for person a to impose his will on person b right you know whether it's it's the government stepping in and stopping it or it's a a bystander stopping the person, yeah. that seems to be reasonable. And, and I'll go a step further uh, down this road, because I typically don't think people should ever have much to do in the business of other people, right? Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm kind of an atomistic sort, right? That we all go bouncing through life to our own, the sound of our own rhythm section, and that's fine. But I was in Baltimore 
this is a bunch of years ago, probably 10 years ago. There was a woman standing next to me on the right, and we're standing at a, a, um, an intersection. And she had the earbuds in and was playing with her phone, and she just walked out into traffic. And she was going to get killed. I mean, there's no doubt she was going to get killed. And I reached out and grabbed her by her collar and dragged her back. And a car missed her by like a quarter of an inch. Okay, am I blameworthy? Did I intrude upon her, her physical being? Um, I did. Clearly I did. I, I Not only did I grab her, I touched her and I, I changed her, her desired movement. I also probably saved her from a whole lot of grief in the best instance and death in the worst. So am I to be um, blameworthy for, for that? And I think all of us would say no. And then we've got all these good Samaritan laws that try to look, look to these sorts of problems and solve them for us. But the fact that we have to solve them indicates that these are deep problems, given everything that we think about all kinds of things. Um, we don't think that everybody should be allowed to grab somebody and, and heave them in a different direction. And why would we, right? That seems perfectly reasonable that we wouldn't want that to happen. So, you know, how do you deal with these hard cases? Frankly, I don't know. That's why they're hard cases. And there's this saying um, that every lawyer learns at some point, hard cases make bad law. And I think that's correct, right? But in the vast majority of cases, we can look at them, look at two buckets that we could throw them in and say, we're really done here. And that, that last 5%, we can argue with over and over and over again, and we tend to. And I, I think that the tie into the suicide example is, in which neither one of us has stated, is that studies indicate that people who attempt suicide or seriously attempt it and fail, 90% of them say after the fact, yeah, that was a bad idea. So so the stopping someone from committing suicide is, is much more akin to grabbing the woman who's about to walk out into traffic than it is akin to, to, to something else. Usually if you can um, if you can occupy somebody for even a half an hour, they, they often never in their lives get back to the suicidal yep. condition they were in. So, you know, it's it's low fruit. I pick that one because it it's such a barbaric act and, and it's it, this is a slogan I know, but it's a permanent response to a temporary problem. And we, we have a chapter in the book on gun control. Yeah. And we look at, we delve into the data uh, about gun control and suicide and homicide and all of this. And, and what we find, we come, we come to, to few conclusions because if you look at the data dispassionately, you find it doesn't point in either direction, right? There are some instances in which gun controls result in fewer gun homicides or other instances in which they result in more. There's no clear, clear relationship here, except when you look at suicides, right? States and periods of time in which gun control, it was harder to get guns, suicide rates are lower. And that kind of meshes with what we're talking about here. The, the, the thing with the gun and suicide is it's a decision you can make very quickly and, it's, and it, it, it rarely fails. Yeah. You don't have the ability to step back and say, well, wait a minute and let me think about this again. And, and here's the odd thing. When you look at gun suicides in places where we've been able to decrease them, they never increase again. And that's the interesting part, right? Because you think, all right, well, you take away one version of, of the suicide and you leave, look, all you need to do is eat an entire bottle of aspirin. You'll be dead by morning. Right? And I think everybody knows this. Um, so there's something weird going on there. And it goes back to an example that we, we pulled out of England. When England was um, powering their ovens with coal, people would go to the oven, they would stick their head in until they, and they breathe until they they die. And this is the, the saying, well, go stick your head in an oven. That was, that was suicide. That was the way the vast majority of suicides in England happened. When they moved away from coal ovens, the suicide rate dropped immediately and never went back up again. And it's that last part that's deeply fascinating, right? Because if you can get the suicide rate to drop for an institutional reason, it may never come back. And I think we have to take that seriously. When, when we say gun violence leads to deaths in the United States, that's kind of correct. Um, two thirds of the deaths are suicides. Two thirds of, of gun deaths. Of are gun suicides. deaths are suicides. Yeah. That's right. So, you know, where that leaves the true believer, I don't know. Hmm. We have a question from Mark Lee yeah. in the chat. 
Um, how do these ideas relate to the role that a K-12 teacher has in their student's life? Is cooperation and coercion in this sense different than between a citizen and the government? Clearly, clearly it is. And, and it has to be, right? You have to, a, a teacher has to have some kind of authority. It's coercive by its very nature. Um, and when I look back at my best teachers, they were very, very coercive at certain times and not at all coercive most of the time. And they, they fed me these cues so that I might be able to understand over time what it means to guide someone, right? So not only did I learn the lesson that I was being taught, I learned this extra lesson that was, of course, infinitely more valuable. And Yeah, and I, I would say that, that the cooperation coercion is, is much more subtle yeah. in, in the case of teachers. There are other examples like this, but we're at university. Public school is a different thing, but at university, the, there's a there's a distinctly cooperative um, set uh, functionality there, and that is that the students choose to be there. They can walk away from the university anytime they want. In fact, they can walk out of my class anytime they want. But so long as they are there, I will coerce them. I will tell them you have to do this, you have to do the other thing. And so, in in an odd way, what's happening is they're using their ability to cooperate to ask me to coerce them. And, and you find this, we found this in the age of COVID. Yeah. The students don't like uh, the online thing. Now, they say they like the online thing, but if you watch their behavior, they don't. They don't like the online thing because when they're in the classroom, I can point to them and I can say, you need to read this thing. You need to answer this question. They actually want the coercion. It helps them to, to achieve the end they're looking for, which is to learn the material and succeed. Yeah, I, I think... K through 12 teachers are very much underrated as life coaches, mm, right? Yep. That, that we learn um, some very, very important things. And I never really thought about this. I just didn't um, until I was uh, professoring, I guess, and my mother was dying. And I had this rule in my class that no cell phone is allowed to go off ever under any circumstances. So that one day when my cell phone went off, everybody stared at me and I said, excuse me, I have something far more important than you to deal with. Mm. And I left and I came back and they all knew she was sick. Mm -hmm. And one of them asked, is she, did she, is she gone? Mm -hmm. And I, I said, no, I just went right back to things. And I, I realized then all of the things that younger teacher, teachers taught the younger me um, by their actions by the way they comported themselves, right? By the way they interacted. And it was a lot. The minute I started thinking about it, I came to realize that they had taught me so much more than the content. That, you know, I don't even, the content was kind of secondary. Right. When it comes right down to it. And I got a different example every year. Mm -hmm. And then when I got to sixth grade, we changed classes and I got multiple uh, versions each year. And they were all coercive. They were. I mean, they could make me stay after school and, and this kind of thing. Um, and they were all deeply cooperative and they were very wonderful for the most part. You know, a couple of clinkers, but not not that many. Yeah. It, cooperative in the sense that you have to agree to be coerced. <laughs> I mean, you could have at any point just said, I've had enough of this and walk out the door, but you didn't. Yeah. Um, by, by the time I was in sixth grade, I really thought about that quite a bit. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I, I did never do it. Mm -hmm. So interesting business. And I think every teacher is just different enough that there could be no blanket rule, right? It's your own would personality. Would you say that, but connecting this back to the suicide example, would you say that a temporary state of mind is part of what justifies um, coercion in these situations? Because when you have young children, their minds are developing and you know that they're going to become different. And when we're talking about the suicide example, you know that that's also a temporary state of mind and they're going to feel very differently tomorrow. So is that sort of the common thread there for why coercion would be allowed? Yeah, I, yeah, that that so, that smells right. And I, I'll give you an example of my teenage daughter who wanted to. I forget what it was she wanted to do. She wanted to do something, and I said no. And she brought up, you know, knowing what we do, she brought up the whole rights issue <laughs> of, you know, well, she's a human being, she has rights, and blah blah. And and my response was along those lines. I said no. Here's the thing. The future you will not want, will it be sad that the current you did what you're proposing. And so what I'm doing, it's not that I'm 
thwarting your will. I'm imposing the will that I know you'll want imposed five years from now. The problem is that currently you're not in that mindset. Yeah, and look, I've got children too. And I suppose I have done this. I don't, I don't narrate it as I do it. But I, I try to do it very sparingly. Because if you do it all the time, you know, right. what, what are you going to end up with then? And then I worry about any time that I might do anything even looking like the same thing to somebody who's not a family member. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, your, your right to interfere disappears the further out you get. And, and it has to be that. Way. Yeah. And, and this is the thing. <clears throat> we understand that you can do this with students. You can do it with children. But when it comes to other adults, if you're going to, to dictate their lives for their own good, what you've really done, I called it a difference in equality. What you've really done is you've set them up as children. You have said, you are not a fully functional adult. I am. And I have the ability, therefore, to impose my will on you. And it becomes a little easier with each passing year for people to use the, um, the coercive authoritative power of government to, to secure these sorts of ends, right? They can, they can satisfy themselves by interfering in the lives of others through government in a way that they would never do it in person. Yeah, and that's the horrible thing, that the person who's imposing his will actually feels good about it you know, I, because I, I'm doing good. I'm preventing you from harming yourself. I, I moved two years ago to a new neighborhood. And it's got a pretty robust HOA, which I absolutely hate. And and then there's a there's a pretty vigorous community on uh, the app, the next door app. And once a once a month, somebody writes a very a variation of the following: I have a neighbor who's doing X, and I really hate that. Who can I call? Who can I call to get to come out to make sure this doesn't happen anymore? And my reaction is always: Why don't you just walk over there like a human being and knock on the door? Right. Well, what the hell's your problem? And but that, that that's a, a, a curious thing that has grown year in, year out. And I've known a couple of small town mayors, and they say that all they do all day long is field questions for people that should be asking the same question of their neighbor. Of their neighbor, right. Yeah. And that they don't have the nerve to do it. So we embolden people to monkey about within the lives of others, which I think is almost always in, inappropriate but we've emboldened them to do it and to use the power of government to achieve it. And, and that's where things kind of go off the rails for me. We should, as we're running low on time, we should take a moment here uh, to tell you, James and I uh, go around the country mm. talking to um, high school classes, typically AP government and AP economics, but we could do others as well, giving lectures on a variety of topics involving you know, political science, government and economics. This is at no cost to the high schools. And we've also, in the age of COVID, learned how to do it remotely. So we right. could do that as well. But at any time, if you're interested in having us come, again, no cost to your school, um, you can contact us. You can Google us, uh, Anthony Davies. I come up the first thing. I met a guy in the last session who we both did a, a Zoom thing in his classroom. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah. I, I didn't remember him because I couldn't see him when we did the um, the event. But yeah. And, you know, some teachers will have us come in just as a one off, maybe for an hour or two hours or whatever it is. Uh, some of them will uh, have us come this past semester. I did every Friday for an hour uh, finance Friday in, a, in an economics cl class talking about personal finance. So you know, whatever it is that you're looking for, we're happy to do. And I, I think it's pretty cool that we could talk to you in this way. Mm -hmm. right? This would have been utterly impossible. Right. Some number of years ago, um, I remember doing some of my papers on a typewriter when I was in college. Right. So this has been kind of interesting and I've, I've kind of liked it. So if, if if a stupid virus gave us anything worth having, it's something like this.